Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to um, QUT. Sorry. Um, as is always the case, I'd like to pay my respects to the uh, Indigenous Elders uh, at QUT. Uh, we work closely in terms of research and teaching and public policy um, with Indigenous communities. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge that um, to begin with. My name is Professor Matthew Rumer. I'm a director of the QT Intellectual Property and Innovation Law Research Program. Uh, particularly over the last few years, we've had a great interest in developing our research capacity, particularly in relation to intellectual property and clean technologies and climate change. We have a very dynamic international law and global governance program that has been doing a lot of work on climate law and climate justice. And in our intellectual property uh, law program, we've been very interested in some of the intersections with that field. Uh, so previously, we've run events looking at climate litigation, fossil fuel divestment, uh, climate business. Uh, but we've also previously uh, had our guest today come and talk about our climate change and trade. Uh, so today, it's my very great pleasure to introduce you to Professor Abby Brown, um, who is returning uh, to uh, QUT after being our keynote speaker last year at a conference on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. A uh, lot has changed in the past year uh, in terms of uh, international developments. We've had the uh, Paris Agreement uh, be accepted by a large number of nation states. The UN Sustainable Development Goals have been promulgated, uh, which are relevant particularly in terms of access to clean energy. Um, but at the same time, you've had a deconstruction of certain uh, forms of climate regulations uh, with both the uh, Trump administration uh, gaining uh, power and withdrawing the United States from the Paris Agreement and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, but also there's been a kind of a Brexit uh, which has been in full force over the uh, past year. Uh, so. Professor Abby Brown is going to look at intellectual property and climate change, particularly in light of some of those developments. And I'd also like to congratulate her on her uh, promotion uh, in the uh, past year to uh, professor at the uh, University of Aberdeen, which is uh, due recognition, I think, for her status as a, a world leader in terms of doing research on intellectual property and climate change. So Professor Abby Brown. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you all for coming along today, and I'm really thrilled to be back, and it's lovely to see some familiar faces. So my title today is Parallel Tracks, the National Relationship Between Intellectual Property and Climate Change. Put this in a little bit of context, this is part of a book project on which I'm working. I've had the privilege, and those of you who are academics will know, um, the very rare privilege of spending several weeks in Australia to redo really research. Normally that's actually never what we get the chance to do at all. And then I've ha presented some work in Melbourne and some work in UTS and now here. And every time I focused on a slightly different part of the project within its wider perspective. So today I'm going to be introducing possible conflicts between climate change and IP. Noting particularly I think that there are problems at national level which are really not being explored that I think these are real conflicts at UTS. We had a wonderful discussion about do these conflicts just exist in my head as opposed to in the real world? And of course, if anyone does take that view, please do tell me. I'd love to discuss that further. But largely today, I'm going to work on the basis that these are conflicts which should be solved and present some ideas which I have on how we might address that. The final step, which again, I will not be focusing on today, but would welcome discussion on, is that if I can create this wonderful new national landscape, is it going to be very vulnerable to investor state dispute challenge processes? And that was what we spent the time speaking about in the main at Melbourne. So some picture, I thought I'd like a picture to set us off. Um, this is one of my favourite places. Um, so I was lucky to have to go back there quite recently. It's Shoreham Beach in Victoria. And one of the main fundamental goals for climate change from a real world perspective is to ensure that these things can be maintained and be kept going. And technology and ideas relating to practice can be seen as a really important way of ensuring that um, human conduct can be managed at least to an extent to ensure that we can address climate change and this can lead to for example a biomass farm a way of using technology to address climate change 
If this works well, we have win-win, we have IP owner making lots and lots of money, and we have these wonderful places continuing. And the real question is, is this just, that's just totally unrealistic, and we have to be a bit more interventionist in ensuring that these things really can be developed and these goals met. So some basics, and I'm bound to treat someone as if they don't know what's going on, so apologies, but I'm going to introduce climate change and IP very briefly. So when I say climate change, I'm looking at human-generated increases in temperature that wouldn't necessarily be happening anyway, which have a negative impact on the environment. And there's two particular themes which I think are of interest from an IP perspective on this. One, the idea of mitigation. How can we actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions? How can we try and stop climate change mitigation? Or how do we accept that sadly it's happened, if not here to stay, how can we deal with the consequences? So this might look particularly at new medicines, for example, new seeds, which can deal with the, those consequences. Some people, particularly climate change activists, really don't like adaptation. They see this as almost giving in. We should focus much more on mitigation, and that's perhaps a, re a relevant point. For those uh, and other reasons, there's been tremendous focus at international level. We have the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, led to the Kyoto Protocol, which ultimately, after many false starts, led to the Paris Agreement, which, as Matthew said, has now been adopted by at least some countries to come into effect. It has set new targets to reduce emissions in a very, very light touch manner. Broadly, the countries have agreed to do it, and it just assumes they will. But Kyoto had some quite interesting compliance mechanisms, and that didn't seem to work very effectively. So perhaps this new, very much creating an international culture of commitment to reducing emissions, perhaps this will work more effectively. And from my view, we, we simply have to live in hope. But a strong theme through the Paris Agreement and through wider activity at the UN is the idea of technology. While there are also attempts to ensure that we live in more sustainable ways, there is a strong message that technology really can be a very important way of addressing climate change and ensuring that it is transferred. Importantly, it is countries who are parties to these agreements. So Australia and the UK, of present interest, they have obligations to ensure, to encourage that technologies develop and that it is transferred. Quick note to take us ahead, the IP owners, they're not party to that treaty and probably a lot of those treaties, they're going to be controlled by the IP owners. There has been, despite the fact I think there's this quite big gap in international climate law, there's been a lot of national action. So Scotland, where I'm from, we have the very recent 2017 plan, and technology is a big part of that. And they're really trying to encourage lots of bottom-up activity, not just for one particular, say, renewable energy or tidal energy, lots of different technologies really create a mindset where people are going to be very innovative, building perhaps on our previous discussion, and trying to transfer them. So this is great, but it doesn't talk about IP. And I see this is a big sort of elephant in the room type of problem. It's just being ignored. And we see this in the more long-standing UK approach as well. So international treaties, international instruments, saying we're going to address climate change, technology transfer, a very important part of it, national steps to try to do that. No one's really quite mentioned IP in there. Flipping over to IP, broadly, and I confess I'm an IP lawyer, been an IP law lawyer for years, I quite like IP, not everyone does. But IP, I think there's at least an argument. IP does encourage and reward innovation and creativity. If we didn't have the IP innovation system, we'd have to have something very, very different. And no one's, despite lots and lots of interesting theoretical work, been able to come up with something that would necessarily work any better. What IP does, it provides private rights. If you've been clever enough to develop something new, you have the right to control it for a while, with some limits. And in the long term, those rights will expire so everyone can share it after that. And for now, we all have the fact there's that new drug, there's that new wind farm technology, there's all those things which are allegedly going to work in South, South Australia, that type of thing. That's all been happening for a long time, and we now have TRIPS um, for several years now. Part of the World Trade Organization Agreement, all countries who are in that, which is most, have to protect intellectual property. So this really does mean that if you are trying to meet your obligations under the Framework Convention on Climate Change, you're going to have to do that while meeting your obligations under TRIPS, which means you're going to have to create an opportunity for people to get a patent for their renewable energy technology. They don't have to seek it, but you have to create that opportunity. 
Again, that's not really mentioned in the climate change technology and, and TRIPS and its discussions. Well, they didn't really talk about climate change. Although this was after Rio, people were well aware of the possibility of this arising. And against this backdrop, we have had, there were always IP laws, relatively always IP laws, and these are very much continuing. An important point, although this is not what I'm focusing on in my work, but it's very much against the backdrop of it. TRIPS, as you, some of you will know, has very effective international dispute settlement sanctions, and these are the things that Bush is apparently going to look at kicking off again against China. So if, say, Australia or Scotland says, we're not going to have any patents for our renewable energy technology. We think this is absolutely the way forward, and that's going to really help us meet our climate change framework convention goals. Well, it's a real risk you will be the subject of trade sanction action. And this is particularly interesting, I think, because as we saw, Paris Agreement and the Climate Change Convention as a whole, it doesn't have that. So if you do get yourself in a place where, from a policy point of view, you want to take, you see this as an either or decision, you're probably going to jump with IP because of the enforcement mechanisms. Now there's been a lot of work, Matthew's been involved in this, other colleagues, Susie Frankel, for example, in Wellington, closer to home, a lot of work exploring how they don't need to conflict or these treaties, if you do get into this international dispute, they can be made to talk to each other. And I think that's really valuable work. Also Henning Grossroos can, if you don't know his work, I would refer you to that. But that's not really talking about what's happening on the ground at national level. And that's really the gap I'm trying to refer to with my scholarship. So it's a little bit small, I'm sorry, hope you can see it, talk, talk through it. So my work is in the backdrop that countries have commitments to climate change treaties and to intellectual property treaties. These can be consistent. Technology can be a way of addressing climate change. Intellectual property can encourage the development of those technologies. This needn't be a problem. They can even be de developed, the, the tools taken to be innovative. You get a patent, it addresses climate change. It needn't be a problem. But I think sometimes it is. And I think just saying that it hasn't happened yet is I don't think a good enough excuse. So what has been happening at national level against this backdrop? Well, this means I then have to start to introduce some other legal complexities. And Matthews and I were talking about all these interesting things which have been happening in the world. They're just making things even more complicated. So firstly, IP law in the UK is a reserved matter. Constitutional 101, the UK is the reverse of Australia. So certain things are reserved to the UK government and everything else was dealt with, for example, in Scotland. But IP is dealt with at UK level. So the Scottish government, it can't do anything about IP. There is IP law, which means that you can get a private right to exclude activity, basic IP law. UK IP law doesn't make any reference to climate change at all. Now this is in the context, okay, these laws are, say, Patents Act from 1977. The Patents Act was revised um, last year about a new regulatory exception. Copyright legislation was revised to include a new disabilities exception. There's change going on all the time but as yet there has been no decision to do that in relation to climate change. There is a very limited reference to the environment in the context of patents grant, but that is all we have. There are some more general exceptions to intellectual property rights, particularly copyright. There is a public interest provision, and if you don't use your patent for three years after grant and it demand is not being met, then you can have a compulsory license. But that's a general provision, and we'll come back to that three-year point later. So in contrast with that, climate change is dealt with at UK level and also at Scottish level, just to make my life more and more difficult. So Scotland has its own legislation to address climate change. The UK legislation imposes obligation on the state, so nothing to do with the IPNRs, nothing to do with the private sector. Obligations on the state to reduce emissions. It says that the state has set itself carbon budgets, how much it's allowed to emit over a particular period. It says that there must be reports to the state. And in doing this, they are to take into account the guidance of the Committee on Climate Change, which is specifically told that it should have regard to technology. So technology is in there quite centrally, but no reference to IP. At Scotland, it's very similar, although the legislation is wider, it clearly imposes an obligation on public authorities, and Scotland is very proud that it actually imposes annual targets to ensure that there is more regular regard to the reduction of emissions. So a lot is going on, and a lot's going on in technology, but not, not talking about IP. 
from there's a lot of discussion going on, some of you might be aware of, about what is climate change law, what is environmental law. The real danger of going to another area of law, you find all these gaps and problems you didn't know they existed. Climate change law, arguably, is simply this. That is what the Climate Change Act says. But there is also a myriad of legislation about pollution, about planning laws, things like that, which can have an impact on climate change. And in the light of the policy document I mentioned and reflecting the legislation we have, we're seeing a lot of activity trying to encourage private innovation, tax breaks, subsidies, that type of thing, to ensure that people are encouraged to develop, say, tidal technologies, not so much solar in Scotland. So it's there. It sort of happens. But I was dis discussing what to do with a, a friend in Melbourne. He said, well, what happens here in Australia is the government does all this stuff to encourage the private sector to do things, and then it's not happy when the private sector doesn't want to share. And I said, yep, that's basically what I do, trying to exist within that landscape. And I think this, from my understanding, this arrangement we have in the UK is probably broadly similar to what you have in Australia. There's, very, there's not much requiring of the state or of the private sector to do things. It's much more tax breaks. And I know there was the, the tax trading scheme, emissions trading scheme, which you don't have any longer. So against that backdrop, what happens if there's a fight? Uh, another confession, I was a private practice litigator for 10 years. I, I know people think, well, I'll just agree and all thing will be fine. But I don't think that's how it works. I think people always want to fight. And I think particularly IP owners will want to fight because they've thrown millions and millions of pounds into their investment and they'll want to have a reward. So litigation pathways, very easy if very expensive and very costly, if you're an IP owner, to enforce your rights. It's a private litigation pathway. You have your IP right. You go to court. You say, here's my patent. They've used my technology. Will you stop them, please? And broadly, the court will say yes. A lot of my earlier work has been exploring how we can bring in other relevant areas of law, such as competition law, such as human rights law, to try to minimize that. But broadly, very easy to enforce your IP right. It is very, very hard to engage in climate change litigation, or certainly on the model that I have just set out. There are, to my private practice, private right eyes, no clear pathways for litigation. But when I put on, and some of you may well know much more about this than I do, but public law perspective, there are a whole set of different opportunities which can arise. Ailey McCarg, a Scottish public lawyer and constitutional argument, a scholar, she's been saying, well, climate change legislation says the state must. And apparently that's actually very unique in legislative wording. The state must. So if the state doesn't, you can sue the state. No one yet has been quite brave enough to do that, but we're really hoping that we might see some of that. And that is part of a growing body of work and Fisher and Peel leading scholars as well, strong Australian element there, looking at how the fact there are more and more attempts being made to pursue climate change litigation under the broadest possible perspective using whatever tools they can possibly find. So we're seeing nuisance type of arguments. There's Combank, obviously, which has recently been the subject of activity here. People are trying to sue. They don't know how, but they know they want to. And I think that's actually a very exciting landscape within which I'm trying to look at how can we try to compare the IP and the climate change basis. So, I would like some more pictures. So we have these agreements, agreements at international level and then within national parliaments, legislators and policy makers that we are going to address both IP and climate change and technology, a strong if unacknowledged common theme across them. But perhaps we still have very strong parallel pathways, particularly, I think, if one can reduce the rights and enforcement framework to the public and private. So you can't perhaps fight enough. Um, is this a problem you can't fight? Is this actually having a negative impact on justice and fairness and indeed addressing climate change? So I'm going to explore this through a possibility. These are things I have made up. I've made these up because none of this has happened yet. I think it really is going to happen. This is, of course, when you are quite entitled all to say, no, it would never happen because. Or the reason it has never happened is because it's not really a problem. You need to get out more Abbey type of thing. But I think I'm right. <laughs> 
for humor me for now. So imagine you have a wind farm technology which is developed, which enables wind farms to be much quieter. I don't know if you know much about wind farms, but sometimes they make quite a noise. I quite like wind farms, but this is quite, quite a hot issue sometimes. Technology enables them to be very quiet. There is no other technology which is as quiet. So the communities are much happier, and the wildlife it doesn't have such a negative impact on the wildlife. And the same company also develops a very effective insulation, which is very effective for heat efficiency. This has been developed with an Australian company. Not so much attention on that today, but obviously for an investor state dispute settlement point, that can be very key. So we've got an Australian company who gets UK patent design and copyright for the wind farm and a patent for the insulation. So things go brilliantly in the UK, but after one year, they simply can't meet demand. Loads and loads and loads of orders, and actually the state regulated inspectors are going out to inspect the houses. They're telling everyone, you've got to use this particular set of insulation, then we'll give you the red star. And it'll, you'll be allowed to work it. So lots and lots and lots of demand, but they simply don't have the resource to do it. And for whatever reason, they're not going to do anything about it. They're not going to share it with anyone else. Now, that is quite irrational. But as many of you will know, this does happen quite a lot. There are many extreme examples of IP owners, for whatever reason, simply saying, no, I don't want to do it. A lot of them in the health field, for example, refusing to share drugs. But we see this in other fields as well. So simply the fact that it doesn't make sense for someone to refuse to do this is not, I think, a, a, a total answer to it. So what might then happen? We could have another wind farm operator who wants to use the technology and who wants to use the insulation. Now, the magic of the patent, so they go on the UK IPO website, they see what it is and they use it. And they get sued. The other possibility, which I think is also highly possible, is that we have Scottish Public Authorities and the UK Government Department who were planning the centre of, of their goal was to say, everyone to use this technology, it's brilliant. And all you wind farmers, please use this quiet one. It's brilliant. Please, please, please do it. But they hear about this action and they say, oh, well, we better not. No one ever told us that IP could do this. And the really scary thing is, I think that definitely will happen because I don't think they know about IP. So they stop. So actually, they're doing nothing to meet their obligations, to meet their annual targets, to meet their carbon budgets. And, building on the arguments put forward by McCarg, the prospect of an environmental NGO suing a Scottish public authority. You're not meeting your obligations. And if they were able to do that, strong subtext, what might come out of that? Well, it's probably going to be something about this IP technology. So the IP owner, they want to get involved in this action. So this is putting forward the possibility of building on the very innovative steps we're seeing for climate change litigation, something else which might happen. So, with the wind farm operator, once you use the technology and the insulation, they sue. Well, the IP owner should win. I say should on the basis of IP law. As we saw, they're using exactly the same technology during the currency of the right. They don't have to share. There's no relevant exception. The IP owner should win. Scottish Public Authority stops their plans to use it. Climate change action, IP owner tries to get in. Certainly at first instance, that case should be kicked out. It's far too innovative. No one will have done it before. Even if you might get the action over the line, probably the IP owner trying to get involved might be seen as a bit too innovative. So we have IP owner winning and nothing happening at all from the climate change perspective. So that, I think, is we have set out two quite possible scenarios and two quite likely outcomes on the basis of present laws. So what do we think about that? I think we should try and shift the balance. I think we should try and take new approaches to existing laws and theoretical pathways to deliver valuable practical outcomes and also which are legally legitimate given the international treaties we have signed up for. Stepping back from that, there is the question, of course, do we really need to do this? I can set up these stories at a party. You know, you've always got to have your answer, what do you do to, when someone asks you to party? I say, oh, I talk about someone doesn't want to share the wind farm technology and that's bad for climate change. 
That's quite an easy thing to say. I'd say that some people believe me, but of course when you dig it into slightly more, well, is that really so? That's a high level conflict, but reality, you don't have to use my wind farm technology. You could just use a noisier one. You could use Tidal. We could all just turn the lights off a little bit more. Do we really need to intervene in IP owned technology so much? And if we do, our IP owners or our innovators, are they really going to develop things? Are they really going to, it's going to be a massive disincentive, particularly because a lot of the funders are actually quite fluid. And they could say, okay, we'll go off and we'll invest in the alcohol industry. Oops, that's another problematic one. Or should we just say, look, come on, well, you're all very clever, that's very interesting, but everything's actually going fine. There's been IP law for years, there's been climate change law for years. They don't need to talk to each other at all. I don't think people can actually make that statement because climate change law is so new and people really don't know what is going to happen. We could say, it wouldn't happen much. We'll just live with it, it'll be all right. It's not like health, which, which is a legitimate point. This is not like health. There, there is more variety. You could use, you could turn the lights off. You could turn to solar rather than being, say, the cancer drug. But I don't think in itself that's much. In fact, I think that's, that's a bit of a cop out. I don't like a cop out. So what I am looking at doing in, in my forthcoming book is to explore new tools which can be used if those two disputes were raised, what different outcomes could come. And I've got two, two main approaches I'll chat through here. One is about the tools I'm going to try to give the court. And then the other one is some theoretical approaches that the court might say, okay, yes, I can do this. This is, I will accept, pretty radical. But um, I am, another confession, I'm definitely a black letter lawyer at heart. So while I'm really trying to um, work in parallel with a lot of policy activist work, I'm really trying to provide some legal solutions which can work. So in the UK, while we have the Human Rights Act, that's probably going to go, just like EU fundamental rights are going to go. But while we have the Human Rights Act, this is an opportunity to be putting before the court the, right, the references we have in the ECHR, rights to life, rights to health, references in the EU Charter to sustainable development, references in international treaties, which we have signed up to on all those points, including references to the environment, and the fact that the UK is involved in the sustainable development goals. Now, rather like Australia, the UK is a dualist system. Simply the fact that we are involved in these treaties doesn't mean that the country has to follow them. But I think these are legitimate bases, particularly when one puts before the court that, hang on, not only have we signed up to these, but these are conflicting. So it's not just if it's unclear, you go with the one which you have to look more broadly. If Parliament is clear, then Parliament wins. We have Parliament not having looked at these issues at all and haven't thought at all about how these international arrangements will talk to each other. That's one argument put before the court. We can use this at a time when climate change litigation is an absolute mess, which I think is always a good time to try and put in an innovative type of argument. We're doing it at a time when with Brexit, no one knows what is going on at all in anything. It's just terrifying. So climate change legislation, as I said, is actually UK and Scottish based. That's not such a problem in itself. All other, EU, all other environmental law comes from the EU. So no one knows what is going to happen at all with that. And for devolution, as we've seen, some of the things are dealt with at Scottish level, some of them are dealt with at UK level. This creates different types of approaches. For example, the Scotland Act, Scottish public authorities and Scottish legislation has to be consistent with the ECHR. If Westminster is crazy enough to get rid of the Human Rights Act, it can't, it's not as easy as doing that for the Scotland Act. So human rights will always continue to have a role in Scottish Parliament and legislation, at least until they create something entirely different. Similar theme on that as well. There's been a lot of work, and um, we saw this in the Kennedy case, and Conor Gerty, who, if you don't know his work, is just fantastic. There's been a lot of thinking on this, that even if the ECHR, the EU Charter, is kicked out, there are actually, in England, there's some very deep roots of common law human rights. Now, interestingly, they were the two the arguments that people tended to make to say, we didn't need the Human Rights Act, we didn't need EU fundamental rights. But now, if they're all we have, people are going back and saying, okay, 
This doesn't mean human rights will no longer be part of litigation in England. However, um, that doesn't apply to Scotland, because Scotland and England have always been very proud, distinct legal systems, something I've managed to ignore most of my professional life, given of the area I work in. So the Blackstone human rights arguments, which might ring vaguely familiar to you, that's not going to apply in Scotland, but there's all sorts of Roman Dutch type of arguments that I don't claim to understand at all. They've all got strange Latin names, but they are tools which I think one can put more and more before the Scottish court in saying you have to make decisions which are consistent with these rights. An area which I'm much more familiar with for the moment is the fact that, again, as you will know, statutory interpretation 101, you start off with what the words say, and if it's not really clear what they mean, then you have to move beyond the literal interpretation. And one of the things you might end up doing is what did Parliament actually intend to do? And sometimes you might be able to actually look at Hansard, which is the record of debate, and say what did they actually say there? And that's Pepper and Hart. What I'm very interested in here is I am convinced, and all my research so far very much confirms, that this is not a situation of people sitting around in, in committee and then in parliament saying, OK, this is the decision we're going to make on the IP climate change interface. This has been ignored. So while there is the established status quo of the place of parliamentary intention, I think we're talking about a new approach here. So we're not ignoring parliamentary intention, we just can't find parliamentary intention. And what can we draw from the other decisions which Parliament and the Executive have made regarding international treaty? In doing this, we can see the work of Aileen Kavanagh, particularly arguing for really limited judicial reference to Parliament, particularly if we are looking at something where there's a human rights type argument. And I think the landscape I would have managed to sketch out that why, sh why should the courts be respecting what Parliament has done, particularly when Parliament actually hasn't done anything at all? And all of this is, I think, freeing up the court to say, OK, we can be bold here. Court can be as bold as it wants to be, but it's got to have a case. And this is when I think the public interest litigation, which is really growing in the UK jurisdictions, the possibility for amicus involvement, so we're called, we look to the possibility of the IP owner being involved in the climate change action. We are seeing more and more of that. And a um, key example of that recently was the Miller case. I don't know if anyone saw the Miller case, which was a Supreme Court question on Brexit have to go before the Supreme um, before Parliament. I've heard many colleagues describe this as legal porn. If you enjoy law, it's just the best thing you will ever, ever, ever see. It's still streamed, you can still go and find it, it's just fabulous. But a lot of the actions which were raised there were by special interest, the parties were um, raised by special interest groups and crowdfunding. You could go online, you could put in some money for someone to be involved in this action. So that, that, that didn't, you know, champerty, things like that, you didn't used to be able to do that. And perhaps in the past, no one really cared enough to get involved in someone else's action. I think the lessons of Brexit and the importance of climate change suggests again that you really might see people willing to pay, willing to get involved in this um, highly innovative action to which then these types of innovative arguments can put foot before the court. So I think from that, I'm going to be arguing that the court really could do something quite different. But it might say, as courts tend to, well, can I really do this? And courts, certainly my experience, interested in your thought, is the courts don't really care about theory and jurisprudence at all, unless they feel they need to, unless they feel this would give them some additional credibility for their argument. And this is very much, I think, where I, I would be putting that through, obviously good from a scholarly perspective, from a court, so the court really could use this to, to support their approach. I think I'm going to be looking at much more of a sort of hearty and judicial discretion type of approach rather than the idea of Dworkin's Hercules. I, th I thought I was talking about more part of the courts so that must be very Herculean, but I think a strong theme through that is the idea that there is one right answer. And I think this is really very much not that there is a right answer, is that we have so many different answers which live in their boxes and we need to pull them together and we need to have this type of dialogue, which I think goes much more to the systems type of theory type argument. There's a lot of very established work drawing on Benyon that statute interpretation, even before we had the Human Rights Act, even before we had EU purpose of interpretation, and you will obviously have purpose of interpretation without the need for the EU, is, has always been there, that it's actually much more complex and creative statutory interpretation than one might think it was from the literal view. 
And then I realised, confession time here, that what I was actually talking about was some sort of postmodern type pluralism. And I was never very sure what pluralism was or indeed what postmodern went, but I think this might be what I am trying to do. I read Sinead Douglas Scott's book, which I find again really fascinating, um, about delivering pluralism, about enabling different areas of laws to talk to each other. But she, I think, was particularly arguing that. Um, we need to get more public law perspectives, such as fairness, such as standing, coming into contract type arguments. And I think that's a very interesting approach. But I realise that what I'm really interested in is absolutely the reverse. I think we have the, we need to get the public law actions to be much more like the private actions as well, to create much more of a wider right to get these actions before the court to ensure that rights you have can be considered rather than leaving it much more within the public perspective. And underpinning these, I think, are strong questions of wider morality, coherence and integrity. To lead to create, yes, a definite revolution, but I would say a legal one. So what might come out of that if we were able to do this? I would say you might lead within the IP action to a finding that there is in fact no infringement. There isn't a clear relevant exception, but one can look to broadly interpret the legislation to find either there is no infringement or there is no remedy. Particularly, there may be no injunction, but I'm trying to get away from that because I feel, again, that is also incredibly vague, very much based on judicial discretion. I think m more clarity would be useful, or there might be no damages or only a reasonable fee. That's pretty radical. Even more radical, I think, would be the environmental court perspective. The possibility that the court could say, uh, it's going to require the state, because the state is to act, that's the aim of the action, require the state to create an immediate compulsory license regime for payments of reasonable fees for this IP to everyone, and also create a function-based standard in respect to the insulation. And this would clearly be because the traditional approach in judicial review, which I always find remarkably frustrating, I know that these are the rules of the game, this is probably all about tearing up two sets of rules in the game and creating a new one. Judicial review normally ends up with the decision maker being told, you didn't do it properly, go back and do it properly. Take into account the proper things, follow the proper process and make your decision again. And this, I think, would be the court saying, no, that is not an appropriate outcome here. We need to bring in maybe more of the private into the public process and lead to this more radical solution. So that's what I'm saying could happen. And of course, I'm aware that if it did, then, um, the then DFAT would be right on raising the ISDS action against the UK, but we'll leave that for another day. So some closing thoughts. I think there are some legal and practical clashes to using technology transfer as a means of addressing climate change. And I think this draws, this is rooted very, very, very deeply that IP and climate change laws are very different in themselves. And this can be seen from their deep underlying philosophies, one being private and one being public. I think that if one is legal, one can, if one is bold, create legally valid approaches through national creativity. I think it won't always need to be done, but I think sometimes it will need to be done. And I think the possibility of it, I think is extremely important to ensure that there is broad, broad pluralism and addressing of societal goals. So that is, I think, where I'm going. Is it really gonna happen? Well, we could just live in our little boxes now, for those of you who are studying, I know IP law is really hard before someone's saying you've got to know all about climate change law as well. Um, so the aim is not that we are all experts in every type of law, but it's creating a new skill set, a new perspective in policy making and litigation to know how we're going to navigate the way across these fields. Or we could just ignore it. I don't think that's really very wise. Or we can try to integrate all of these things to have this one little solution which is coming out at the bottom. So I'm looking forward to working this further and I would very much welcome your thoughts and thank you for having me back again. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, just, just for an opening question before we open up to the floor, uh, I just wonder, thinking about the real world conflicts between nation states, um, what are your thoughts about some of the geopolitical battles? You know, sometimes there are mega conflicts. So, for instance, the United States is very upset about a Chinese company called Sinovel, yep. accused it of trade secret theft. Uh, 
Um, there's also been very significant battles in India with Monsanto over climate ready crops. But sometimes there are cooperative efforts. So, in an inconvenient sequel, Al Gore is kind of pictured trying to reconcile India and the United States uh, during the Paris Agreement negotiations over IP and climate change. Um, I, I wonder what your thoughts about that, the clashes of nation states and um, how you resolve mm. some of those conflicts. I think from the examples you set out, I think there is a very strong base for that. And I think although those disputes will continue to happen, I, I think it ha there is an awareness across states and through NGOs and through large companies that this is a problem which has to be solved. And I think in comparison to what I'm looking at, I think there isn't that awareness at, at, at national level. So I think we, we are seeing people are, are knowing, and whether that's drawing on the work, you know, back to Seattle all those years ago, that people are going, they're arguing, they're saying this is a problem. Well, at the Copenhagen discussions of climate change, there was a great deal of work. People are saying we need actually a new declaration on IP and climate change to stop this happening at international level. That didn't actually happen, but perhaps that did lead to this technology mechanism, some of the activity we're seeing. So I think there will always be transnational, sorry, in, international dispute on that. But I think there is at least that recognition of the, the legitimacy of the problem. And I think maybe we can see the reactions to Trump's behavior to Paris, that he's pretty isolated. Thankfully, I would say, um, but you know, everyone else is, is 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 drawing together. So perhaps I think there is that international landscape that although the um, the Monsanto ledger speaks will happen, there'll always be fights. There's probably more, I would say, agreement as to where broadly the countries are trying to go, and then a more awareness to try to find a solution to tr and to try to support their more black lettery scholarship type of approaches, and that's just not happening at um, national level at all. Questions, queries, comments? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, I think that was really interesting. Just made me think about some things I haven't thought about for a long time, or not at all. And um, during your talk, I started thinking about this dreading how useful it is. Mm. Yep. And I was actually doing it, because I hadn't thought about them for a decade. Yes. Trying to read up how I read it again. And I recall the, the idea that kind of was to deal with emergencies and things like that. Yes. Can't produce the vaccine fast enough. Yep. Yep. Everyone's going to die, so you give this out and that comes with it. This seems like a similar kind of scenario yep. where you just have to really, really need to raise the level of this is an emergency that yes. has to be dealt with. Um, yep. And I like if I, and given that there's remuneration for the IP owner and the Crown News provisions in Australia, I've never really thought I had to think about it before, but I mean, does that still comply with trips? Is it going to have money for trouble with trips? No, that, that's a re re really interesting point, and someone always raises something like that, so I should always mention it much, much more clearly up front. Um, so firstly, yes, there's Article 31 of TRIPS, which says that countries can create systems, the kind of compulsory license systems more generally, and the kind of systems to deal with national emergency. And that was something which um, really came to head when South Africa tried to introduce some public health points, um, and actually which was really the worst thing um, the US Pharma ever did because then they challenged that in the South African courts and the world woke up to the evils of IP. Although there are many good things of IP, the world woke up and this, that I think has led to the discussion of where we are, where we are today. So you can do it, but you have, you have to be careful what, what, what you do and still be consistent with trips. Crime news, yes, it can work really well. It obviously is only done by the state, um, but the, you, if you did have the state who was really aware of these particular problems um, from a climate change perspective and was wi willing to really step up and do that, then that could work. I mean, a very similar arrangement which do exist in the UK. The interesting thing, I think, um, I think there are except the, it can be the state or it can be someone authorised by the state. But I spent quite a lot of time in my earlier work thinking, okay, so we're going to have, it's going to be the, the government is going to set up the wind farm for example, because the government is, suppo is supposed to act, um, or, or it could, could be CSIRO. But these examples, they're not actually happening very much because the government is doing nothing. So action is actually becoming increasingly, increasingly privatized. So I think we have, we have a big gap there as to whether these things are then being used. There is also, I think, the problem about, is this an emergency? Addressing climate change, I would totally agree, is an emergency. But I think a lot of my work is perhaps existing in a bit of a gap, because you, the, um, certainly with climate change, unless we really are only going to use 
offshore wind to address climate change in Scotland. Now, interestingly, there, there's a case involving the RSPB. They've appealed it up to the Supreme Court, but the Scottish Parliament has come out and said offshore wind is our main answer to addressing climate change. So we might be moving a little bit more, more towards that. But because there could be other types of renewable, because there can be, again, different types of transport, different types of heating, just turning, turning the lights off, it is hard to actually say it's an emergency. But that is absolutely part of, part of the picture. Yeah. Yeah, because and on often it and yeah, it's just a tiny little thing change I think in the perspective as to what as to what can be done and then because of that cash at the beginning of the slide that always comes back to it as well. Thank you. So my question kind of leads up that um, and the windmill example where yep. it's um, you know there are arguments that you could just use a different technology yep. or you could just use the noisier yep. wind farm. Yep. Um, it seems to me that that that's right for like truly transdisciplinary Absolutely. law reform and regulation yep. in, the, yep. in that like science will tell us that time is of the essence, behavioural economists will tell us that we have to reduce the barriers to people adopting these things. Yep. Do you see that there's scope for law reform to come from that sort of transdisciplinarity or is that too abstract for judges and buckets? Um, I think it's probably too abstract for this particular thing I'm working on right 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 now but I've got I've got an application and if it doesn't come off I'll just have to try and reformat it and try again um, but that's about yeah creating almost a, a new research agenda transdisciplinary research agenda part of it is trying to encourage more courts in more countries to have this sort of pluralist approach but also to look at working with policymakers and to look at working with legislators to, to really realize that you can't just say well we've got crime news and that works sometimes so we've got our answer we're fine which you know it's it's true, there is an answer there, but it won't cover anything. And then there's climate change. You say, well, our rules are, you know, it's just going to be fine. Um, they, need, they need to speak. They need to get out, outside their comfort zone. And that's other culture change we, we were talking about earlier. It's not just the courts, but I think maybe from some of the things we have seen, um, the IP competition interface, the IP human rights interface, a few court actions, I think, can really help the generation of, of, of that approach as well. But def I, I, I mean, that is the answer because no one really wants to. You know, people will be activists and people will join crowdfunding, but no one really wants to run a test case. Really, it would be much better if that can then precipitate much more sensible participatory well, dialogue. Um, I'm just wondering about. It seems as a bit of a contradiction about climate change uh, requires new technology to really effectively combat it. Yep. But the more effective that new technology is, the more likely it can be expropriated from the person who's developed it. Does that mean there's going to be less incentive to develop effective I, I absolutely agree and I think this is part of the real problems and we always see this when we are in dialogue about, about IP. Now some people will say IP is the great evil and we could all cope perfectly fine without it. I don't tend to buy that A anyway but B certainly within our present innovation landscape. So I do think we have to be very very careful that while you are creating arrangements and um, that perhaps you don't end up with too much no injunctions and um, too, too much n n no fee outcomes because people really will say well no I'm, I'm not going to do this now this might lead to the government encouraging another different form of development but innovation um, governments over the piece I think have proved to be quite poor predictors of what's the next new technology that we are going to develop so I think that is what makes it so, so very very hard for this particular area of work, my real fear is that people haven't had that conversation. You know, if, if, if you could find something in Hansard or you could, you could find out that people really did have that conversation, but it's far too risky, so we would just stick with what we have. I could probably begin to live with that, although I still think it's dodging the question a little bit. I think it's more now that that conversation is not taking place. A lot of the UK policy documents, you know, if you're lazy and you just do search for intellectual across a document, um, you see one sentence which says IP encourages innovation, full stop. That's it. So that's the level of dialogue there is. So I totally agree that one must be aware of the, the wider problem. So it's difficult, always going to be difficult, but I, I think that conversation does need to start. I don't think this was so much a question more than a comment because like one of the actual last pieces of research I did was, was in looking at the bottlenecks of deployment 
technologies yep. in climate change. Yes. So assuming that money was no object and everyone put up their hands and agreed we just mm -hmm. need to deploy tech yep. uh, to address this issue, renewable tech and sustainable green tech. This actually didn't even flag on our radar, uh, which is, is really interesting. But or I mean, it might be because it wouldn't exist in my <laughs> head. <laughs> the no, other no, 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 fair enough, right? But like, it's, it's really interesting because it really is a question of rate limiting. Mm -hmm. And what is going to be really the key bottlenecks to deployment? Is it going to be people? Is it going to be specific mm -hmm. skills? And yep. Skilling time legs and everything along with that is going to be the rare earth metals or some other kind of componentry mm -hmm. that's actually really going to be the rate limiting aspect of this. It, it's just going to, it's, uh, do you feel, actually, if you have a question, if you have a question this, do you feel like this could be the ultimate, like the biggest thing that could be? Um, no, I, I, I mean, I think there's quite a lot of similarities perhaps between your two questions. Um, I think I, it could be. Um, I, I, I think the possible, from a practical point of view, I think the possibility of this, particularly the, um, the fact of actions against the state for not taking more actions, suddenly they really are face to face, well actually they can't do any more because the rights are, are privately held. I think that is a practical problem and then from a more theoretical point of view I think this is a real problem which does warrant discussion. But I think um, th th there are many more practical problems which will happen before that, which are exactly the ones that, that, you, that you are saying. Um, to get To get your your wind farm into the market, to anyone to want to use your technology, often it just, it just isn't happening at all. Um, and people are very, very conservative about the, the things that, that, that they want to do. So there's many, many other problems which should happen, I think, before the one that we hit. But again, I don't think that warrants this one being, being ignored. The other point, I think, um, and in one of the other um, presentations I put in on this, I suddenly say, well, next year, there's, there's an even quieter one, which is what will happen. Someone will do something massively interventionist with this particular quiet technology, and the next year, something else is going to come along. How is any solution going to accommodate that, that possibility? You can't do nothing and hope that a better one is going to come along. So how will we deal with that? And the case which is going to the Supreme Court involving the RSPB is about um, basically wind farms, farms killing birds very broadly. Um, and over time, since the initial planning uh, and the reports have been done, the wind farms had got bigger, so they're now killing more birds. And, and that, I think, that's again the closest type of case that I'm beginning to see. I'm really interested to see where that line of cases goes in the future, because they could say, okay, well, that, that's the one you're like, we will only give permission for that particular one because we don't want them any higher, say. And that might go into a requirement by the planning authority, for example, that that's the type of technology to be used. That might be very inconsistent with further innovation. Again, I think these are more conversations which do not have clear answers, um, but they're not happening. Uh, sometimes in the international climate talks as well, mm. the discussion about intellectual property got sublimated into other discussions. Yep. So there was a very heavy focus on climate finance and the yep. role of the Green Climate Fund at the Paris Agreement and, exactly. and the New York Climate Summit. Yep. Whereas intellectual property was somewhat of a taboo topic, there was much more discussion about how do you get sufficient private and public finance, in both in relation yep. to the development of clean technologies and their diffusion and distribution to kind of overcome some of those contradictions that yeah. you already point towards um, yeah. and technology transfer yeah. was you know the other topic that they've been working on there's various different technology networks that have been yeah. developed both formal and informal in terms of the international climate process and what happened in the, the Paris climate talks. Absolutely and I think it, it, it's really interesting because I think in in those discussions I think people did know about IP and they were desperate not to, or certainly some people were desperate not to talk about that because we saw that that's happening at, at Copenhagen. I don't think that's what is happening at national level. Um, but then there, there's also, yes, the fact that um, there's so many other steps which are getting, getting money, getting expertise, getting capacity in the right place. That is very, very, very important. Valuable work being done that the most, the most valuable technologies for addressing climate change are already known. They're not the subject of IP. It really is technology transfer, which is important in that context, rather than the, li the link with IP. But there's, this is, again, not, not acknowledged. And maybe I'm just too much of a lawyer and I'm not too much of a, of a political activist to, to accept that. But I feel that th there are valuable issues which are still being ignored while it's totally understandable that that, that, that emphasis otherwise.
I think we probably need a question from our Griffith uh, University colleague on, on questions of climate change and development. Well, I just wanted to know what is your thought about IP climate change and technology transfer to developing countries. Mm -hmm. What do you think about it? Um, this is one of the yeah. debates that's going on. For Absolutely. I, th I think it's... I think it's one of these things that my, my lawyerly brain takes over because one of the things I say to my students when I, when I first go in, and don't worry students, I won't ask, make you answer the question. Um, but you know, so the idea that say a UK patent is causing people to die of AIDS in Rwanda. You're like, well, no, it's not because the UK patent has got absolutely no impact in Rwanda. Now, of course, one can extend that more widely if there's no factory in Rwanda. You want to get the drugs exported if the, they, for other reasons, the best factories in the UK, then there clearly is an impact. But you know, it's, it's a much more complex situation, as you know, than can, that can be developed in that. So I think there is what type of country are you looking at? What is the actual factual scenario? I think there's also some really interesting work, and the Barton report is very interesting on this, and Ravi Srinivas's work is, is also really interesting. It can be quite, there's quite a tempting view sometimes that all we need is um, transfer of technologies from the developed country to the developing country, and it'll be so easy. And that really doesn't work. Um, technical needs in the recipient country are often very different to, to, to the developed country. A lot, lot of arguments should be much more sort of south-south transfer. And also, even if you are transfer, well, is, are we talking a license or are we talking some machinery? What about all the capacity? So I think it definitely is something which requires ongoing attention. Um, I know that uh, the climate change um, in the climate change convention work um, technology needs assessment are a huge focus of the work which is going on on, on the technology mechanism. But my my, my feel or my feeling is that IP is not necessarily the main problem in that. So I know the Barton work is is very revealing on that. Equally, I know it's either Boliv Bolivia or Ecuador and has been very active in really trying to push still, particularly at trips for um, a declaration on IP and climate change as well. So it's really, really active. It's really, really fascinating. Um, it's something that I've probably quite deliberately chosen not to make the main focus of my work, as I did with health, because I feel there's just so many other sort of moral and ethical, but you know, of course this should be done. <laughs> um, whereas I, I, for, for my work, I quite find that perhaps when it's out of a framework, of course it should be done, then legally people can't hide behind the politics. But I welcome your thoughts on that. Definitely. No, I mean, I, I don't know, I just want to think about compulsory licensing, mm. and so those can be some of the options. Abs absolutely, and there's lots of arguments that, um, you know, that there should have been, the, and there maybe there still will be a, an IP and climate change de de declaration, but uh, as we were saying before, you know, there is the base of that under TRIPS anyway, if you really can find this particular situation from that particular technology, you really do need it, then you can do that under TRIPS. But, um, and maybe this goes right back from having been quite dismissive of what's going on the technology mechanism. M maybe it's actually rather necessarily looking at IP. It is about looking at the tech, if you, what is that one thing that you really, really, really need? But then in that case, yes, compulsory licensing, absolutely. And the bigger literature these days too on yes, very um, the public health impacts of climate change. Yes. You know, the World Health Organization. Yes. Uh, I'm just reading the late Tony McMichael's book yes. on all the various um, health impacts of climate yes. change. I, I, mean, I think in some ways the parallels with the access to medicines debate will be quite helpful once I we're think, thinking I about think the public right. health impacts and of I climate change. And I think yeah, it's almost it's coming back to a second phase when one is seeing m much more both both in health and sometimes in culture as well, where there's been say, well, yes, it's a problem, but it's different. We're like you're really seeing the reality. These are very very significant, and the, and they were required to be, to be reviewed. Question from a student. I see quite a few students here. Just the one thing. Yeah. Climate change is a global issue. Yes. So, don't you think that this global consensus is more, much more necessary than changing domestic legal IP proceedings? Um, I think they're both very important. Um, no, but, uh, and, and I think. If you, if you want to change the domestic law, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. most of the least developed countries and mm -hmm. some of the developing countries has not yet framed IP laws properly yet. Mm -hmm. They first need to incorporate the basic uh, IP laws. Mm -hmm. Then they will think of incorporating the uh, climate change issue, issues. They, they could. I think that's actually a really interesting point. I would suggest that if a country is able to be really starting with no IP law, 
they should be doing it together and they should be drafting that IP law with a climate change exception or at least thinking do we really need a climate change exception how are we going to take into account encouraging either national innovation or foreign investment why are we going to that while we are also ad address addressing climate change I think we are in a place where there is an international consensus and I think although we can pick apart the compulsory licensing point, for example, I think there is an international consensus that we need to protect IP and we need to address climate change and technology transfer is a big way of doing that. But it's the national questions of how this is being developed. Now, my focus has very much been in, in a developing con developed context, the reasons I was saying. But I think if you are actually able to start it off again, there are a few now, I published a piece when I looked into, I think Korea, a few countries do have um, sort of climate change compulsory licenses for patents, but not much, and there's much, much more scope for doing that. And I think the real answer, if you really are sitting down and trying to do it, and you'll be very careful what wife will tell you to do, there's much more flexibility than is often allowed to try a, 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 and accommodate both. Can I have all these rules? <coughs> Sorry? Technology, Technology transfer. Yes. Yeah. Developing countries are not keeping their promise under WTO. Yes. They just Agreed on WTO mm -hmm. that, and that if you uh, notice the language, it's very uh, disappointing language. Shall seek to improve. Shall seek to improve. Does it yeah. make any sense in case of technology? Transfer? I agree equally. I've got, I've got two PhD students who are arguing that 662 and 67 are mandatory and that action should in fact be raised yeah. to, to force action to be brought about. So I, I to totally agree. So, so Professor uh, Carlos Carrera, yes. um, who does a lot of work with the South Centre, has been doing a lot of work Absolutely. on yes. technology transfer through the ages and whether or not particular obligations have been honoured or ignored yep. or avoided. And uh, I, th I think there's also a lot of discussion about transcending some of the old notions of technology transfer well, as well, indeed, which I think, I think is really what, is, what you What is are, technology transfer, you, you I think, is a very important point. Pointing to, yeah, um, yeah. I think. I, I mean, I think, I think the question of, of nation states is also interesting, thinking about mm -hmm. Australia and mm -hmm. the United States. Mm -hmm. The real clean tech innovation seems to be happening mm -hmm. at the state or the territory level. So yes. in Australia, South Australia has done a big deal with Elon Musk Absolutely, for a yes. big battery, and it's just announced a big new thermal solar project. The ACT has been very innovative in terms of some of its solar and wind projects. In the United States, you know, Trump is withdrawing from the Paris Agreement, but there's an alliance of uh, states and cities Absolutely. wanting to honour yep. the Paris Agreement. Yes, and um, we also have the um, innovative actions being raised by youth activists yeah. against part particular states there. So, so yes, I think... Um, the UK is quite disappointing because of its lack of state action. It's so much left the private sector. So I, so I think these issues perhaps become much more pronounced. But lots is happening, very, very definitely. And I think it is certainly very important that um, you know, the attention, I hope, will come to my suggestions isn't at the expense of the, the wider funding, the, 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 the wider encouragement of innovation more generally, which is going on. But I think it does warrant attention. Uh, this is kind of more in respect to not necessarily climate change, but um, genetic, yep. genetic innovation mm -hmm. and yep. around the, the agricultural industry. Um, what are your comments on, I guess, um, IP that's being developed off like, in, uh, traditional knowledge mm -hmm. or um, things from nature? Like how yep. can TRIPS protect traditional knowledge? Um, for example, a lot of companies that use traditional yep. knowledge to develop IP and then mm -hmm. Like there's not really a defence for the traditional owners of that knowledge that their technology is being taken against. So I think a lot of that it depends exactly what is happening in each particular context. Um, um, but so if, if we take, and I know this doesn't always sound, but if we take traditional knowledge, which actually is very much known within a, within a community, and someone goes along and patents it, which certainly has happened, well, that's just not new. They shouldn't have got a patent for it. This, of course, doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but um, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't have that. So if someone does have the money to go and challenge that patent, that patent can be revoked, as has also been from the, from the BRCA patents, for example. Um, an extra twist, of course, is that sometimes some traditional communities, the knowledge has actually been kept secret. 
So then it, it's, it's actually difficult to say it's not new. So, so, so maybe actually that has been, according to pure patent law, that is legitimate. And that's why I think there's been a lot of discussion within TRIPS and also through the Convention on Biological Diversity, whether there should be some sort of declaration of interest as to whether this information has come from, um, and hoping then, I think, to lead to some return of the benefit to that. So that's one of the points that I think we see. But broadly, broadly TRIPS um, is probably not the right instrument. TRIPS is very keen on protecting IP, and it's very, very, very Western. Um, the CBD, the plant treaties also, for example, are often try, try, trying to produce ways of protecting more developed, kind of broadly developed and traditional interests. But again, back, back to my obsession, they don't have any enforcement mechanisms. TRIPS does, if they clash, which they very often do. It tends to be TRIPS which, which is prevailing. Uh, some, sometimes there's been some very innovative um, climate litigation too by uh, indigenous communities. So I was off in Alaska the other year having a chat to the lawyer for Nelson Kanek, um, who's an indigenous Alaskan youth who brought an action against the state of Alaska, both under its constitution and under the public trust doctrine, saying that Alaska had engaged in climate inaction and that indigenous communities in particular had been adversely affected both in terms of a physical sense you know literally his uh, village was melting away uh, but also in terms of the associated um, indigenous knowledge so i think one mm. of the really interesting new developments has been climate litigation uh, but because indigenous communities are often at the front lines of climate change increasingly i think indigenous communities will be bringing action in relation to climate matters including in relation to indigenous intellectual property i think i think that's right and that's often very much not using ip um, one can see sometimes very effective uses of human rights depending where you are depending what the constitution is um, treaty which name I have forgotten but some of the regional treaties are, are very effective and uh, in Inuit actions have particularly been seen so there are ways that actions can be brought there are a lot of my obsessions again are about pathways sometimes there's no pathways there's lots of pathways for IP there's not as many pathways for, for otherwise um, and traditional like, it, it's so well established as a problem but it's um, but it's probably been established as a problem for what 20 years longer than that and it's it's not getting it's not getting anywhere to the black letter solutions, there's a possible revision to TRIPS, that's not coming. But I think in terms of wide acceptance that new approaches are required. And you know, CSR issues, things like that. IP owners actually, I think they're a bit more aware. They don't actually want to get the, they don't want to be criticized as much. They realize this is not a good thing. So that's not, I still think it's important the law should reflect the wider values, but I think the landscape has changed. It, it's just been the 10th anniversary of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous oh, Peoples. Yes. You know, Article yep. 31 has a very holistic definition yep. of the indigenous intellectual yep. property. There was, there was a very specific effort with the Anchorage Declaration, which was designed to try to extend on drip to deal with questions of climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, there are questions there about how yep. that is implemented and, and how that is dealt with. Uh, but it's an interesting, complex uh, issue, I think, in terms of the intersection. Absolutely. And I think, this, back to a very general point underlying a lot of my work, I think, is to be at least familiar, to know those other areas of law exist, so they know that they can be explored. Um, if one is only obsessed with you know, the, the difficulties and the interests of one area of law, then you're probably going to not have the to as many tools as you might be able to address a problem. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Abby Brown for visiting thank us you. again. Thank you for having me. And for her expert learned explorations of some of the inter intersections between intellectual property and climate change. Uh, if you're interested in today's uh, topic, uh, we're going to have another couple of events in terms of some of the groups of QUT Law. Uh, our group is holding an event on the 5th of September looking at climate business with Professor Christopher Wright. Okay. And I think at the end of August, the health group um, have a big event on climate change Fantastic. and public health, which kind Brilliant. of taps into some I'm of the things jealous. that we're discussing. So if you enjoyed this talk, we have a couple of other things happening over the next couple of weeks. So Fantastic. thank you very much. Nice talk. And thank please you. eat some of the remainder of the food, particularly hungry students. Yes, absolutely.